to The Church 247 on the Now Television Network. Today we are here to interview Shivana Kennedy, an author, writer of a book called She Overcomes. I want you to hear her testimony. It's written in her book, and I want you to be prepared and also clench your heart because I know that some of the things that you will hear today, many of you may have experienced yourself, but one thing to know that God is a healer, God is a deliverer, and God can change your life. We'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, Shivana, welcome to the Church 247 on the Now Television Network. Give us a couple of minutes to tell us about yourself. Okay, well, first I would like to say thank you for having me. Um, my name, of course, is Shivana. Um, I was born and raised in the city of Long Beach, California. Um, I'm a mother, I'm an entrepreneur, and now an author. And most importantly, I'm a daughter of the king. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, for those of you who may not already have it, this is the book, She Overcomes. Um, and I'm noticing the very thing, first thing that stands out along with your shirt are the butterflies. Can you talk to me about these butterflies? So the butterflies, rep, the butterflies, and then we have the little trauma sign. Oh, so, that's true. Yeah, the trauma oh, sign. Okay. So the butterflies represent me blossoming out of the trauma into a beautiful butterfly, overcoming all those things that were meant to break and destroy me. So basically the butterfly represents life. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So this is a tree with lots of butterflies. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to go through some of these um, chapters. So talk to me a little bit about um, what's in this book before I go through specific chapters. So some of the things are that are in the book are, um, I talk about the narcissist. Um, I talk about a little about generational curses. I also talk about, you know, um, overcoming the trauma, things you can do to overcome the trauma, things that help you through the process. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, there's a little poem in here that I saw, and this was by John Mark Green. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read this poem. You tried to cage and contain her, drain her of her worth, beat her down to nothing with relentless fists of words, control and desole her, but she is resilient. Bamboo to your storm, bending but not breaking, now taking back her true form, Courage building like a tsunami, ready to lay waste to your city of empty promises. She will rise above your shallow ruins like the moon in all her fullness, free and beautiful, luminous. Your hungry night tried to devour her, but she made her own light that darkness could not swallow. You are hollow and aimless. She has carried life hidden within, a seedling drawing skyward towards the sun of better things. Your heart is salted earth, your body and walking mausoleum. You fear freedom and love control, mistaken intimidation for true power and captivity for devotion. Devoid of emotion, you're dead inside. Wanted to bury her with you in a graveyard of lies, but she will rise, she will shine, she will shine. She will be so much more powerful than you. Unstoppable John Mark Green. That's so, yeah, so, and forgive me because I failed to mention domestic violence, which is a huge part of my story. That poem um, was inspired by uh, me overcoming domestic violence. Um, all that was said in that poem was, that was me. That was all that happened to me. That was, you know, that was everything about me. And so um, it's just a poem saying, you know, basically how I overcame him can no longer be controlled what you tried to do it didn't it didn't fall through it didn't fall through yeah, it's a, a mausoleum no. of lies yeah he's a dead person okay all you right tried to cage and contain me all of the above okay but not so okay all right tell me about chapter one safe but unsafe Okay, so safe but unsafe. Um, that's the story um, about me being in foster care. Um, I was in foster care. It was with family. Um, you know, I mentioned in the book that, you know, being in foster care, um, I 
being taken out of one place and put into foster care, Mm -hmm. you know, most of the time people think that foster care is a safe place, which it should be a safe place. But unfortunately, sometimes it's not a safe place. And for me, it was not a safe place. Um, Safe, but unsafe. I was supposed to be safe, but in actuality, I was unsafe because I was violated in that foster home. Can you go into a little bit of detail? So, um, yeah, sure. So I lived um, with an aunt. Um, You know, let me just go back a little bit. So um, me and my siblings, we were removed out of the home of my parents and my brothers and sisters. They we were given a choice as to who we wanted to stay with. They chose to go stay with my grandparents. I chose to go stay with my aunt, which is my mom's identical twin sister. Um, I chose to stay with her because she didn't have any girls and I didn't want to be a greater burden on my grandparents. So I chose to stay with her. Um, in the beginning, everything was great. Um, she's always treated me as her own, never anything different. She treated me as her own child. Um, her husband, he was a good provider. Um, he loved his boys. Um, everything was good at first. We were a family. We did everything as a family. Everything was great. But a, about a year into living there, violation began to take place. And um, I was violated in ways that are unimaginable. And um, unfortunately, my aunt, she didn't know what was going on. Um, I was watched um, in the tub. Um, I was shown parts of a man that no child should ever see and um, some other things in between. But like I said, my aunt, she didn't know. And I wanted to tell someone, but I was so young. I was afraid. I didn't know how. And so things went on. Today, I read a um, a story about a woman who had a child care. Mm-hmm. And her husband had, well, he was in jail mm-hmm. after charges was filed against him mm-hmm. and after he was shot by mm-hmm. his wife. Mm-hmm. So they found out, I believe it was like over 38 children he had touched in the child mm-hmm. care. Um, and she was so shocked. And some of the stories were so intense. I think they described three of the stories and they knew that the children, um, who told those stories Mm -hmm. were not lying. They Mm -hmm. gave them specifics of where it took place Mm -hmm. and how, whether it was in the car or the area off away from the rest of the children. Mm -hmm. Um, and so thinking about that story that I read today, and that was in a daycare. Mm -hmm. Because that is a a violation of those who are to care for you, responsible for Mm -hmm. caring for you. Mm -hmm. So with you being in your own auntie and uncle's Mm -hmm. home, because that's your uncle. I mean, how did you tell her or did you ever say anything to her while you were there? So I never said anything to her while I was there. I actually carried this trauma for 13 years before I told anyone. And that was a friend. I carried it about 31 years before I actually told anybody in my family. As a matter of fact, my plan was to never tell anyone until he died or just to not say anything at all. But one day, um, as he was in my city, um, I, Long story short, I had an encounter and I finally got the courage and the desire to confront him. It just like came over me. So I knew it was time. And I just got like this, this, this awakening where I just wanted to confront him so bad. And he was near, he was near, but I knew I had to do things in a certain way. And so, you know, I wanted to use wisdom and, um, Later on um, that night, I ended up telling my aunt, I, 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 I took her off somewhere and I had a talk with her and I let her know um, what was going on. And I asked her, did she know? She had no idea. As I told her, she gasped for air and she asked me, um, why, have, why didn't you tell me? And I was like, you know, I said I was a little girl. Like, I didn't know how to tell. 
how to tell as much as I wanted to tell. I didn't know how to tell. I was afraid. And even in my mind, I'm thinking, even as I got older, I didn't want to break up a family. I loved my aunt. I loved my cousins. I didn't want to make a big, you know, even though I should have, but I didn't. So where did you get that idea from? Did he mention that to you? If you ever told or? No, he never mentioned that to me. He never mentioned that to me. That was just something that was in my mind that I automatically thought. Hmm. Yeah. Because usually children don't think of I'm a break of a family. Yeah. That was actually as I got a little older, like into my teenage years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I held it for so long. Not so much as when I was, you know, younger, but as I got into my teenage year, years, it was like, okay, I don't want to mess with that. You know, I don't want to mess with the family. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, after you had that confrontation, what happened? So after I talked to my aunt about it, even before that, um, I actually had to, um, no, I talked to my aunt. She was the first person that I talked to. And I also got some counsel, um, from my spiritual leader and, um, that helped me a lot as well and to recognize some things. And, um, so I talked to my aunt, then I had to go ahead and talk to my sisters about it and other family members. Um, everybody was I, some people were shocked, but the sad part is there were also some people that tried to get me to still keep it a secret. Um, they felt that I shouldn't tell other people because it would, you know, uh, rear some things up, you know. So unfortunately, some were telling me, you know, just keep it hushed still. But I'm like, no, I'm not keeping it hushed. I'm like, this is my story. And I've also come to realize that when you don't speak up about certain things, it remains a secret and it gives it more power. So I was like, mm, it stopped at the blood, the blood of Jesus. And so I said, I'm going to expose this thing and everybody's going to know who the child molester is. And, and so I did. I was able to tell everybody and finally get it out to everybody. Um, some didn't say anything at all. Um, some were shocked. And some tried to still get me to keep quiet. And there are um, no statute of limitations on these cases. So have you ever considered going to the authorities? You know, I thought about it. I thought about it. But I, no, I didn't do so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that probably has a lot with me to do with me being like... Mm -hmm maybe empathetic, but yeah, because, you know, it made me think about it um, because he's around other children, you know, and mm -hmm. no telling what's going on. Mm -hmm. I even had to warn his boys, um, you know, because his oldest son, they were having their first, they were having their first grandkid, their son's first kid. Mm -hmm. And I had to, I felt like it was my duty to let him know what was going on before he had an encounter with the baby. And so I let him know what was going on. And that was another that, you know, didn't say much and was just kind of quiet about it. So what's that like now with your uncle? So um, they live out of the city. And um, my aunt did confront him about it. She did confront him about it. Um, they went out somewhere uh, for a family gathering. She ended up confronting him and leaving him where he was at the gathering. And she was um, disgusted with him. And she asked him about it. She said, did you molest my niece? And he said he didn't remember. And tears started rolling down his eyes. She said, why are tears rolling down your eyes? And he said he began to tell her about some things that happened to him. And um, he stated that he didn't want his boys to find out anything. And so it kind of took away the attention mm -hmm. of what he exactly, done to exactly, exactly, and mm -hmm. put it on himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he manip manipulated mm -hmm. that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that why you talk about well, because that would be a level of a narcissist mm -hmm. if it was d a diagnosis. We use that term narcissist, but it's actually a diagnosis. But we use it as character finding, mm -hmm. and so that would be that kind mm -hmm. of personality mm -hmm. trait mm -hmm. because it 
deflects mm -hmm. and puts all the attention on someone mm -hmm. else that never loves to and never acknowledges guilt. Right, right. I think it's kind of like gaslighting or something. Yeah, some, mm -hmm. in some sort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, you talk about the nor the narcissist with the uh, personality disorder. Um, that yes, that mm -hmm. that goes with that. I also spoke about that as far as like domestic violence. I was heavily involved with the narcissist. Um, at that time, I didn't really know what a narcissist was. Um, but I do now. And um, yes, the narcissist is very controlling, manipulative. Um, self-seeking, self-centered, um, will step on whoever to get what they want. And, um, they, the narcissist tries to make you feel like you're crazy when they're the ones that's mm -hmm. actually crazy. Mm -hmm. And they end up having you believe in the end that it's really you. You know, if you don't know better, they have you to believe in that it's really you when it's not you. Okay. So how was your relationship with your uncle? Um, my, as a child, as a child. Um, so it was, um, it was, it was okay. It was okay. Except for when that started, but me, I, I buried this thing so far that I believe that it wasn't even real. That's how far, far I buried it. So does that mean that you would live life regular regular yes so mm -hmm. it was like as if no one would know mm -hmm. and you wouldn't show any signs mm -hmm. that something was wrong you would never know that he was molesting me because i acted as a regular child i mean i went through my own things inside and um but nobody ever knew i mean i would laugh with them mm -hmm. i would still go out and do the family things um I would, uh, you know, sit and talk to him. Um, we would go to the movies, you know, do all of the family things. And, um, but nobody knew that this was happening. So yes, it was like a regular relationship. So did you have a cousin or someone in the home that may have noticed? Usually there's always mm -hmm. one of the cousins, somebody who would see something and not say anything. And then later on, mm -hmm. when everything surfaced, mm -hmm. they go, I remember. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything like that? So the thing about that, I was the oldest. They were all younger than me. And I began to live with my aunt at about the age of five years old. Mm -hmm. So they were all young. So they didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what was going on. Like, it would be times we just going back, went to the movies, and he would have me sit in the front seat, and they would sit in the back, and he would touch, and different things like that, but they were young. They wasn't paying attention. They didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what about when you were around your auntie? When I was around my aunt, she didn't, she just didn't get it. She didn't, she didn't know. She didn't know. I'm asking because, um, a lot of times mm -hmm. when they've gotten away with something mm -hmm. for a long time, they'll make little jokes. Mm -hmm. They'll make little They'll do little things in front mm -hmm. just to see if somebody caught it. Mm -hmm. So that's so. How old you, you said it started at five? Yeah, I moved in about five. It started at about six. Okay, I would say about six. Years and then old. how how old were would you say when it ended? Maybe um, thinking back at about the age of nine. Okay. If I can remember correctly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Some things are blanked out. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say about the age of nine. nine so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cause usually they do little side things. Mm -hmm. Even if your aunt, some things will probably come up mm -hmm. that she didn't mm -hmm. remember because they're slick with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then she'll think about it. You know, I remember he would say little things like, you know, um, you are, are you out there messing with those boys? You know, you're fast and different things like that. Even I would even sleep a certain way. And he would say that it was hoish for me to sleep that way. And, and I was a child. Mm -hmm. I was six years old. And mm -hmm. I'm like, this is just comfortable for me. I'm like, I'm a child. You know, what's mm -hmm. going on up there? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and obviously something was that, going on up there. Those, those are some mm -hmm. of the words. And mm -hmm. so that's them putting words on you mm -hmm. along with their sadistic mm -hmm. 
um, predatory nature. Wow. You know, so mm-hmm. that's why mm-hmm. I'm asking this question because it's going to lead us to the domestic violence okay. that you mentioned. Okay. Because you can see the root mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of where things come mm-hmm. from because mm-hmm. of the training under him. Right. The training. Wow. Right. In that household mm-hmm. and how you were groomed for future mm-hmm. mates. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking. So he said save, but unsafe. Yeah. I was supposed to be safe, but I was unsafe. Mm-hmm. That was my family. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the uncle that was supposed to be protecting me came the monster hurting me. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Has he ever apologized to you? He's never. So the day I um, confronted the situation, he ended up going back out of the city and um no he didn't nothing at all nothing at all mm-hmm. nothing at all silent no more silent no more so um i was silent for so long um like i said i held on to that thing for 13 years before i told anyone and 31 years before i told anyone in my family and um you know as god led me and i wanted to be free and he wanted me to be free I said, I can't be silent anymore. Like, I have to say something. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you never know who else is going through something. You know, my silence, breaking the silence not only helps me be free, but it may help someone else. You Mm -hmm. never know. It may help someone else. And so I said, I'm not, I got tired of being silent. I got tired of holding that for so long. Like, that's heavy. You know, that's hard. That's heavy. And I was like, no more. The little girl inside was like, it's time to be free, you know, Um, because the little girl inside would act up, you know, Mm -hmm. um, very angry. And so it was time to be free. So I said, I'm not going to be silent anymore. I'm going to speak out and everybody's going to know. And I don't care what anyone says, what anyone thinks, everybody's going to know. So when you came out with your book, Mm -hmm. Well, everybody knows. Everybody knows. Okay. Yes, yes, and um, and I'm so happy. Mm-hmm. Like that was a very off like um, so um, to be quite honest, mm-hmm. um, some don't even know what's in the book, and a lot of my family hasn't even read the book. Mm. So yeah, I haven't even been asked about the book. Mm. Like nothing. Okay. Yeah. All so, right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, they're going to be interested pretty soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't know, mm-hmm. they'll be, they'll, it'll, it'll spark their interest. No longer will I hide. What would you say is hiding from? Where were you, you said no longer will so, I hide. So, no longer will I hide. Basically, no longer will I hide what I have to say or how I feel. Because a lot of the, a lot of times I've suppressed the way that I feel about something mm-hmm. because of what somebody else may think or how they may feel. But I decided I'm not going to hide anymore. I'm going to let it all out and I'm going to be free to do that mm-hmm. no matter what. So when you say hide, does that mean your identity was not all the way out so, where people knew who you were now? So no longer will I hide. It, it has to do with that as well um as a person yes as a person my personality my characteristics um not only that hiding this thing these things that happen to me as if they never happened so no longer will i hide i'm it's it's going to be known it's it's going to be out there it's going to be known i'm not going to hide it anymore i'm not going to suppress it anymore mm-hmm. it's going to be known how would you say this curved your your experience, this one particular experience that you're talking about now? Mm-hmm. How would you say this have molded or shaped your personality that you had from that time as a young little girl mm-hmm. to maybe your 30s? Mm-hmm. Well, it really brought on some negativity um, in my life um, as far as um, anger. Um, just being really angry and outrageous sometimes, Mm -hmm. um, being bitter, Mm -hmm. um, kind of hard, just real hard and hard hearted. Did it make you hate men? It didn't make me hate men. That's, um, 
one thing I have to say, it, I don't think it made me hate men. Did you um, view them differently? You know, I was more watchful of them. Um, I was more watchful and um, just, I was more skeptical. I think I became more skeptical mm-hmm. of them. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe at times fearful, a little fearful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it did change me. Yeah. In some ways. Okay. Where was your mom put on this? So my mom, she was going through her own things, you know, her situations. Um, my brothers and sisters and myself, we were taken out of her care. Um, she was, um, she had an addiction. And so she was off and on, off and on, off and on. And um, she was in the picture, but she was doing her own thing. She would come and go. She would come and go. So how did that affect you all? Because people with addiction mm-hmm. choose their choice mm-hmm. over their own mm-hmm. children. Mm-hmm. And they don't make attempts to um, change the lifestyle mm-hmm. until they're forced to, mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So because their addiction means more to them mm-hmm. than the children. Yeah. So what was that like? I know you had your auntie, mm-hmm. but what was that like as a child growing up, knowing their mom was somewhere and usually children hope for their mom mm-hmm. to come back and get them. Mm-hmm. What was that like for you being the oldest too? So, um, I was the third oldest. Um, I had three brothers and two sisters and I was really the one that was always away most of the time okay. because I was either in a group home or in foster care, mm-hmm. but they were all with my grandparents. They were all together. I was always kind of like separated, mm-hmm. but the t- there were times that my mom did do what she was supposed to do to, you know, get back on track and to get us back. So we were brought back into the home at one point, but then again, she would go off and do, you know, do what she did. And we, you know... Well, my brothers and sisters, they always kind of resided there. She would Mm -hmm. just come around and be there and different things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Speaking as far as me, um, there was one time where she did do what she was supposed to do. And I was able to come back into the home. But she had a boyfriend and um, she was in love with this guy. She was really, really in love. They were together for a while. Um, We were all together at one point. And me and him didn't quite get along. He was very strict and dominant. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't a troubling teenager, but you know, I would like to hang out and you know, different stuff like that. And um one day, um, as I was lying down at home, my mom she told me to get up. And I'm like, okay, it's about maybe about nine nine PM. She's like, get up. And I'm like, okay, where are we going? She's like, We're going to a meeting. And I'm like, okay, um, it was kind of odd to me because it was nine o'clock and I'm like, where are we going? But because it was mom, like, come on, let's go. I mm-hmm. knew everything was going to be okay. Mm-hmm. So um, someone picked us up and she ended up taking me to a teenage shelter. And I was like so disturbed and angry because I was like, I couldn't figure out what I did so wrong for her to put me in a teenage shelter. Mm -hmm. And she was like, you're going to be staying here for a while. And I can just remember just yelling like, I hate you. Why would you do this? Mm -hmm. And I felt like so betrayed Mm -hmm. and, you know, all of those things. And um, she left me there and I always kind of knew in the back of my mind that it was him that put her up to it. And so I was there for about maybe a month and a half. And um, I ended up, I was sad at first, but I ended up enjoying my stay there. Um, The staff were very compassionate and kind. Um, I met some good people there. And after a month and a half of being there, it was time for me to go because they could only hold you there for so long. And I cried like a baby mm-hmm. when I had to leave there. I was like, please let me stay. But they was like, you can't. They let me stay a little while longer, mm-hmm. but they couldn't continue to override that. And so I ended up moving to Los Angeles, California in a group home. Um, but um, there were three different homes, six girls to each different home. I was in one home for a while. And then I moved to another home that was a better fit for me. And I ended up residing there for a couple of years. And then after a while, they closed down. Oh, wow. And then I ended up moving back to Long Beach, where I'm originally from. And um, I moved to a foster home in Long Beach. And um, 
the only thing that gave me hope about that move, you know, I was used to moving around. I was used to moving around. I was just like, I'll get used to it. I, I always do, you know. And um, the only thing that gave me hope about that last move was that my immediate family stayed nearby mm-hmm. and I could visit them on the weekends because I loved to visit my family, mm-hmm. to be with my family. Mm-hmm. I mean, my foster mom, she would try to take me places like fun places mm-hmm. and I didn't want to go because I wanted to be with my family and she just couldn't understand it. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, but she took really good care of me. Oh, yeah. Do you stay in contact with her at all? Unfortunately, I don't. I went back to her one time, you know, after I had Ari and um, she was happy to see me, but I never went back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Overcoming trauma. Mm-hmm. You talk about three different traumas, acute, Mm -hmm. you talk about chronic, and you talk about, is that complex? Mm -hmm. Complex. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I I still, I need to look at my book for that one, but it's, I'm trying to. It's okay. Okay. Just talk about the trauma, because you said overcoming it. Yeah. And your your book is entitled, She Overcomes, Mm -hmm. and all these experiences you brought up so far Mm -hmm. are very traumatic, Mm -hmm. very traumatic, and when you're in it, mm-hmm. it seems normal because that's your normal, mm-hmm. but it's not normal for other people mm-hmm. who have not. So this was a lot mm-hmm. of trauma. So let's talk about the overcoming part of the trauma. So um, overcoming trauma is, um, oh gosh, this part right here. Um, overcoming trauma is a big thing for me because there was a time that I didn't think I was going to overcome. And um, oh, I'm so sorry, y'all. It's I'm just okay. Trying to, like, it's okay. Okay. Because you made it past it. You yeah. Through it. Yeah. I, um, I mean, overcoming trauma, overcome, she overcomes basically is a book written of me overcoming everything that was meant to break and destroy me, Mm -hmm. but it didn't break me. It didn't destroy me. You know, it slowed me down a little bit, but it didn't break me or destroy me because I'm still here Mm -hmm. and I'm able to still have my mind. Like a lot of people that went through some of the trauma that I've been through, like, unfortunately, like they didn't make it through, but you know, um, I overcame and I continue to overcome. I mean, there's a lot of things that I have overcome and there are things that God is still helping me to overcome. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just to name a few of them, anger is one of them. Um, Anger was a big thing that, you know, kept me bound. Um, Nervousness, that was something that really held me back. Um, Oh, I hate when I get like this. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. All right. It's all right. This is the hard part for me. I don't know why. I'm mm-hmm. over here. It's all right. Because, see, you have on here the butterflies in the tree. Uh huh. And there's what is called um, monarch programming. Mm-hmm. And it is based upon trauma based mind control. Mm-hmm. And usually the butterfly represents the undergoing of the mind control. Okay. So it's Project Monarch. And so this is a hard thing. Okay. Because there's more of a base and a deeper depth of what you have experienced. So it deals with your identity. Mm -hmm. And this is dealing with all the pain and the suffering that you experience. And God is still working things out in you. So even as you wrote this book, it's such a huge step. This is a huge step. And sometimes when you're in that right, that, that mode to write, you're just writing. Right. As it comes, you're right. just writing. Right. But you're writing and you're also walking in healing. And then you walk through the life of it. Mm-hmm. Wow. So this is why um, it's not shocking to me. Okay. That this is a little, um, little hard mm-hmm. because these are the parts of, like I said, the um, project MK Ultra mm-hmm. Monarch. Mm-hmm. These are the things that they have for trauma-based mind control, 
and there are other deliverances that will take place mm -hmm. and continue in mm -hmm. that God will begin to form you now mm -hmm. because these things are now coming up. Yes, yes. See, now yes. it's coming yes. up. Now it's now it's here. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I commend you mm -hmm. on taking such Thank of you. a great step to do this because even your family mm -hmm. is not even aware of what's all in here. Right. Right. Um, it's a lot of things that when you said hide no more, mm -hmm. that's like you were hidden. Mm -hmm. So now you're coming up. Now you're rising up. The true you is rising up. Mm -hmm. So that's why I can say I can commend you on doing these things because you have walked through so many mm -hmm. um, experiences. And like you said, you're still here. Mm -hmm. And it's like, my, it's so amazing because it, it's unfolding like mm -hmm. I've already written it, mm -hmm. but it's unfolding now. Like some of it is literally unfolding in my life now. now. Like mm -hmm. the deliverance is going forth like now. right now. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that's like so amazing. And when I wrote this book, like God literally led me. Mm -hmm. Like when I say he led me and when I would put certain things, he would be like, no. Do it like this, like so strategic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's so awesome because like it's literally unfolding. And I had no idea that it was going to happen like that. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like I overcame like that. Mm -hmm. like, no, you're overcoming now. Right. Even now. Like, right. yeah. So and that's what's going to happen when people read this book. Mm -hmm. So as you read this book, you will notice that. Things that you have experienced, you're going to walk it through as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's also a prayer in this book. There's also, um, so it's a soul tie breaking prayer. So tell us about the soul tie breaking prayer before we go ahead and close. So the soul tie breaking prayer is, um, it's actually something that I had to do when I was connected with this soul tie. Um, a soul tie is like, um, an invisible umbilical cord that attaches you to another person. There can be a healthy soul tie or an unhealthy soul tie, a godly soul tie or ungodly soul tie. Well, obviously, an ungodly soul tie is not a good soul tie. And um, it's like you're connected to a person. Your souls are intertwined with each other so much to the point where it's like you're basically one. Mm -hmm. And you really shouldn't be one with anybody unless you're married, like, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, the soul tie breaking prayer is just a prayer um, for one to help you get free from that soul tie because you got to speak it out. You know, you have to call your soul back, mm -hmm. you know, return to them their pieces and, you know, call your soul back into alignment. And so it's just basically a prayer that, you know, helps you to be free from that ungodly soul tie because an ungodly soul tie opens up the door to so many other things and negative, you know, entities. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Okay. So, so for other people that are suffering, what would you recommend for them to get help? So um, for me, um, I, um, I found people that I could confide in. And I also um, prayer, a lot of prayer, mm -hmm. um, the word of God, of course, because the word is life. Mm -hmm. And also therapy. Um, I know a lot of people, especially in certain cultures, they think that therapy, you know, you have to be mentally ill, you know, to go to therapy. Um, and thank God for the therapists that can take care of those people that are, you know, mentally mm -hmm. ill and just really can't help themselves at all. But um, therapy is good. Mm -hmm. If you can find, um, you know, a good therapist. Therapy is really good. It helps to have somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. It helps to, you know, um, it helps to have somebody to talk to, you know, um, and also, you know, just uh, limiting yourself from certain situations mm -hmm. and people and um, circumstances. So for those of you who um, would like to, to, uh, to buy a copy of this book, she is on Amazon. She is on any any place that you would like to purchase it. Um, you can contact her. Information will be posted. But we do want to thank you, Siobhan, thank for joining you. us in today. Thank you. And we are so honored and just proud of you for taking this great step. It's a step. And it's such a great step. So we will continue to be praying for you and your family because God got some awesome things planned for your life. So God bless you. 
God bless you. Thank you for joining us, the Church 247 on the Now Television Network. And we will see you all next week.